works, y'all. When we talk about the finished works of Christ, I want y'all to hear this. I want y'all to hear this and get into your spirit. Come on. My sins are gone. I want you to get that in. Say it again. Say it. That's good news. That's good news. So we're going to speak. Wake up my soul. Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we are going to continue in the book of Hosea. And as I studied and, and prayed about this chapter before going into it, it is uh, at a quick read. It is not the Christmas week, you know, the week leading up to Christmas. This is not the sermon most people would be preaching because there's a, a profound rebuke and, and the judgment of God coming forth against the land that is turned from him. So this probably isn't going to be your hoorah, jump, scream, shout message, but it should change your life because if you see God's heart in discipline, it will actually cause you to turn back to him and to go deeper in the relationship with him. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to get right into it. So Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in the body, the mind, the will, and the emotions. Conforming us into the image of Christ. Growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let this word go forth unhindered, unchecked by any outside or demonic force. God, I thank you and I love you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, as we get started today, we're going to jump right in. I'm going to read through all of Hosea chapter 5, and then we're going to go and we're just going to talk for a few minutes about the implications of God's heart. So Hosea chapter 5, verse 1, Hear ye this, O priest, and hearken, ye house of Israel, and give ear, O house of the king, for judgment is toward you, because you have been a snare on Mizpah, and a net spread upon Tabor. And the revolters are profound to make slaughter, though I have been a rebuker of them all. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hid from me. For now, O Ephraim, thou committest whoredom, and Israel is defiled. They will not frame their doings to turn unto their God, for the spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of them, and they have not known the Lord. And the pride of Israel doth testify to his face. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. Judah also shall fall with them. They shall go with their flocks and with the herds to seek the Lord. But they shall not find him. He hath withdrawn himself from them. They have dealt treacherously against the Lord. For they have begotten strange children. Now shall a month, a month devour them with their portions. Blow ye the cornet in Gibe, and the trumpet in Ramah. Cry aloud at Beth Haven after thee, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel have I made known that which shall surely be. The princes of Judah were like them that removed the bond. Therefore, will, therefore I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked after the commandment. Therefore will I be unto Ephraim as a moth and to the house of Judah as rottenness. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, they went, then went Ephraim. Ephraim to the Assyrian and sent to King Jerob, yet could he not heal you nor cure you of your wound. For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, 
And as a young lion to the house of Judah, I, even I, will tear and go away. I will take away and none shall rescue him. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. And in their affliction, they will seek me early. Now, this is a powerful rebuke that God is giving in the, the, the prophetic word coming forth through Hosea is dealing with the judgment of God that is going to be poured forth against the land of Israel and the land of Ephraim and Judah. Now, when reading through the book of Hosea and the book of Isaiah, Ephraim is uh, the term used synonymously with Israel. So sometimes they just say Ephraim and they mean Israel. They mean the northern kingdom. Because remember, in 921, I believe it's 921, the, the civil war happened, which split the two kingdoms, Israel on top, Judah on bottom. And Ephraim is most is, is used synonymously. It's the, it's, they use Ephraim to mean Israel, or, or the, the northern kingdom. So that they're used very synonymously. But also... The, the part that I saw, you know, you can study this in verse 5. It said, And the pride of Israel doth testify to his face. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. It said Israel and Ephraim. Now, I think that's really important to see because Israel referencing the northern kingdom, but also it says Israel and Ephraim. Now, I want to know why would it be referenced twice? And I think this is the distinct point when you need to know that Ephraim was the one that received the first blessing from Israel, from, from his father. So you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name was turned into Israel. And Israel blessed the 12 tribes. The, tw the 12 children he had, he blessed them, which became the 12 tribes which went into the land. Now, when Israel went to bless, he put his right hand on Ephraim, the second born, and blessed him. He received the, the greater blessing. So he became this like royalty above all of the tribes, which is important when you read verse 5 because it says, Shall Israel and Ephraim? Because this rebuke is not just towards the northern kingdom and the land of Israel as a whole, but very specifically to the royal part of the land, the people that are in authority. And we talked about this over the past couple of days that when spiritual authority goes away from God, it turns the whole land. Because most there is there is very few leaders throughout history. There's more followers than there is leaders. And leaders have such a great influence and with most people being followers they tend to just go along. And so if the leadership turns away, the whole nation starts to go away. And that's very important to understand when it says, shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity, Judah, the southern kingdom, also shall fall with them. Now, man, this is so powerful. Verse 6, they shall go with their flocks and with their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He hath withdrawn himself from him from them. Now you need to understand that this is the same, this is the same principle out of the Song of Solomon in chapter 5, where it said that he withdrew, that the Shulamite, the bride, goes after, but it said the Lord hath withdrawn himself. It's when the children walk into a place of iniquity, walk into a place of sin, turn from God and go down this path that God withdraws. Like sin causes them to go away from God and then God withdraws. He's no longer bound by covenant because you've broken it. You've went into sin. You've turned from God. I just, when I, when I read through the when I read through the judgments and the discipline of God, 
the same way in which you read the, the law in the Old Covenant, where God says this, 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 you must follow, or this, 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 this is going to happen. A lot of people, when they, when they read the Old Testament, they can't get through the first couple books because they get stuck in the Leviticus and they start reading all the judgments and all the things you have to do and not have to do and then all the plagues that come and all the all the uh, all the judgments that come if you don't uphold the law and when I read through these things I always like to remind people that you need to go back to chapter 1 chapter 2 chapter 3 over and over and over and read this in context to God always bringing forth a plan of reconciliation and restoration for the people that turn back to him because when the when the judgment and the discipline and when God turns you over and lets you go and do what you want and he says okay that's what you want you have made your choice you have become resolved in your sin in your treachery that I'm I'm gonna let you go if you want it that bad you can have it but in doing that in choosing the wickedness of sin and choosing the evil and perverseness that you're going to go into, he said, my plan is that you would come back to me. You would see the state you're in and then turn back and come back to me. And I see that being one of the greatest hearts of God. That as, 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 a, as a perfect father, that he... he he tells us not to. He puts the signpost in front of us. He woos us. He, he does everything he can to, 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 to hinder us from going there. But there are still people that will be resolved in their sin, that will choose any way to go down that path and, and to choose wickedness over good. You know, choose unrighteousness and sin over holiness and purity. And God said, when that day comes, he said, I have a plan if they're turned back to me, but I will let them go into this. And it is destruction. Verse 9, Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. Desolate. Sometimes I, I think people don't really believe when God says something that he means it. That these people will be desolate. Among the tribes of Israel have I made known that which shall surely be. Now, I, I, this is why I think this distinction, because sometimes Ephraim is referenced as the whole of Israel, the whole of the northern kingdom, and sometimes I believe it's separated on purpose, like in verse 9 where it says, Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke among the tribes of Israel. That the specific tribe of Ephraim, the royal tribe, a tribe that's set above all others when looked at through the, tw like if you see all 12 tribes, they're set apart. And this, this desolate and rebuke that is coming is coming against the royal part. The, the part that's, uh, that's, that has the wealth and the status. That if, if there's... I believe sometimes it's easier for people that don't have much to trust God. Because they don't have anything else to put their hope in to bring forth the provision. You know, they, they're, you know people that are... I just go ahead and say it's the people that are poor. They need some help. to. Tr they need God to bless them and, and carry them through. But sometimes it's status and wealth and royalty and position that causes people in their heart to exalt themselves in their own work. To put that above trusting God. And then to eventually just withdraw and turn from trusting God completely. And in this position... They will become desolate in the rebuke. This is so powerful because like I said, if we go back to verse 5, it says, And the pride of Israel doth testify to his face, therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. It's the pride. And we talked about this a couple days ago. It's that self-exaltation. Because pride isn't just thinking more of yourself or thinking less of yourself. I mean, both are true. Pride in and of itself is making you the central focus and not God. And people that don't, in the natural, I guess we could just say people in the natural that don't need, when we say quote unquote, don't need God, meaning they have wealth. They, you know, they don't have, you know, they're, they're not in a 
position financially where they would have to trust God for their for their food the next day. They're people that have no money. They have to trust God for their food. They're in a position where they don't have and they need, and there's a position of needing to trust God. And this is this deception. I, I use quote unquotes and it's I, I'm very careful when I say this because we all need God to be our source. We all need God to be our provision and our protection. But there's this there's this counterfeit security. There's this deception that the enemy uses that because you're royalty, because you have money, because you have status, that you don't have to trust God and you exalt yourself in your heart, which leads to the fall, which leads you to becoming desolate. It's one of the most dangerous things you could do. And for most people, they classify it as their security. I, I, I counsel a lot of people, and I, I've spoken to a lot of people uh, since becoming a pastor. And one of the things I tell people is money will not solve your problems. Money will not be security. It will not be happiness. It will not be joy. And I have people all the time look at me and say, well, if I just had a little bit more money, then I would, I would, I would be okay. I would be able to trust God more if I just had a little bit more money. If I just had a little bit more of this or that, then it, then I would be okay. It would, it would be just fine. It wouldn't be fine. And that's the deception that the enemy uses. It's for you to think in your heart that something outside of God could be your source and be your protection. I had somebody tell me one time, they said, I'm making this much money. If I just made you know, another $20,000 a year, then I, I would be set. I'd have everything I need. It's a deception. It, it, it can never be the source of what you need. When I was uh, in the motorcycle business, and this was years ago, this probably three years ago, four years ago now, I was making decent money. I was making over $200,000 a year. I, I was doing very well for myself. I had anything I could possibly want in the natural. And a gentleman came in and, and was financing a $30,000 motorcycle and he and he asked me and we were talking and I, you know I did his financial paperwork cuz I was a finance manager and he wanted only to deal with me and not with a salesperson because of the amount of money he made you know he's like I just want to keep this as private as possible and I said okay and I'm not going to reference his name or where he works or anything like that but the amount of income he made was over $300,000 a year this gentleman made over $100,000 a year more than I did and I went through all his paperwork and then I asked him a question. I said, uh, what's it like making that kind of money? My first year in the motorcycle business, I made 70 grand. Within two years, I was making over $200,000 a year. I had progressively gone higher. I thought 100 grand was gonna be a lot. Then I realized it's not really that much. I moved to 200 grand. I was like, I think this is gonna be a lot. It's really not that much. It seems like a lot of money, but this gentleman made a profound statement to me that I didn't understand for three years before it finally made sense to me. This gentleman said, if you make 200 grand a year or you make 300 grand a year, he said, it makes no difference. He said, when you make more money, he said, the expense will grow. And at the end of the day, there is no happiness in making more money. He said, if you made my money versus what you make now, he said, it will produce no more happiness in your life. He said, it's not fulfilling. He said, your life will change, your lifestyle will change, your circumstances will change, and at the end of the day, how you feel in your heart will not change. And that didn't make any sense to me for a long time. But three years later, when I was making over 300 grand a year, and then I started making almost 400 grand a year, I realized what that man said to me when I was, you know, 22 years old, 21, I think I was 22 years old when he said that to me. He said, if you make this, it will not make you happy. And when I made it and then made more than that, I realized it never makes you happy. It never will make you happy. It never will be the fulfillment that you're looking for in life. 
and I and I and I and I, I give that testimony. And I know we're not really studying a lot today, and I'm really just talking to you as a pastor because I I, I wanna I wanna not just I wanna give you the word and give you the foundation, but I actually wanna give you truth, practical things that will help you. And this is what the Lord is saying in this passage, that there is nothing outside of God that can be that fulfillment. It, it, money can never fulfill you. It's a deception to think that it will. It's one of the greatest deceptions the enemy uses. And I tell people this all the time, it will not work. You'll look up, be making that kind of money, and be just as empty, if not more empty. Because you could profit in the natural and be completely desolate in your personal life. Your heart can be destroyed. Your 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 family could relationships could be destroyed. It, you could become desolate and still be growing financially, or like a lot of people do, they get to the point they make that kind of money, make some wrong choices, and become desolate even in the financial realm. Also, it's a deception of the enemy. So I, I encourage you: don't put your trust in anything outside of God. It will not be a fulfillment. Ephraim is oppressed, verse 11, and broken in judgment because he willingly walked after the commandment. Walked after the commandment, talking about the fact that he has turned from God. He has put his trust in other things. And these two verses, let's read those last couple verses. Verse 13. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrian and sent to King Jerob, yet he could not heal you nor cure you of your wound. For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion and a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will tear away and none shall rescue him. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. And this is and this is God's heart. He's turning you over and letting the destruction come into your life. Because in the point of seeing a sickness and seeing a need in your life, the people still chose yet not to seek God. They sought something else as being the source. When you think money is your source and money is your fulfillment, then you make more money and it doesn't become your fulfillment. And you realize, man, I fell into this deception and it wasn't that. And then you look to something else. Then it's, okay, well, let's do, let's do houses. Well, let's do cars. Let's do women. Let's do relationships. Let's do drugs. Let's do substances. Let's do alcohol. Let's do gambling. And you could use whatever example you want. And Ephraim went down into Assyria. And then we got to know that Israel went into captivity into Assyria. This prophetic word is about the captivity into Assyria in 721 BC. Hosea is prophesying about 40 years in advance before this happens. But God says, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense, till they repent. And when they repent, they seek my face, and in their affliction, they will seek me early. Right now, they're not seeking me. Right now, they're still trusting in other things to be the fulfillment of their life. He said, but there will come a day when they will seek me early. And we're going to know going into chapter 6, chapter 7, we're going to talk more about restoration. But I, I, I want you to see this today. I, I can testify personally that there's nothing on this earth that can, that can fulfill your heart outside of God. And there's a deception that once you've achieved certain things that you look at other things to, to fulfill you. The same with Ephraim. I'm going to do it on my own. Oh, that's not working? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek somebody else to help me. It's still not turning to God. And so many people, myself included, I did this. So when I, when I say these things, I'm saying it from a heart of wanting it not to happen to you. I want you to learn from the things that I made mistakes in. Money, there's, you can look to one thing, it doesn't work, you start looking to another thing, that doesn't work, you start looking to another thing, church, I did it all. That car didn't work, so I bought another car. That car didn't make me happy, so I bought another car. That house didn't make me happy, so I bought another house. 
that much money didn't make me happy. Let's try to make more money. And it was just over and over spiraling out of control, thinking that something else could make me happy, not understanding that the only source of fulfillment in life is God alone. And we're out of time today. So I pray, Father, bless these people under the sound of my voice. Father, teach them that you are the source of fulfillment in our life, that everything we need comes from you, and that we trust you as our source. We repent and turn back to you because we believe that only in you and through you will we find fulfillment, security, protection, and provision. God, we love you and we thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Church, have a wonderful day. We will see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. I pray you have a wonderful day. See you tomorrow, church. My soul.